These times it is necessary for us to rather carefully evaluate the circumstances of the day and also to try to understand as thoroughly as we can the factors that contribute to the essential progress of mankind. The great journey of man is a long one. Its beginnings we know very little about. And in the narrow band covered by history, we observe the struggle of the human being through various emergencies which he has created largely for himself, partly by ignorance and partly by the misuse and abuse of what he likes to call knowledge, which perhaps is only another name for ignorance, for if we abuse, we are ignorant. We also realize that at almost any point in man's career, he might have come to a hopeless blocking of his progress, had not crisis arisen. Now we look back over the pages of history again, and we find almost constant record of crisis. Various nations in various degrees of cultural development have come again and again to those critical periods in which it seemed for a moment that their national destinies were lost. In these critical moments, violent, often vicious circumstances arose. And in due time, there also rose a remedy against the immediate evil. The individual found some strange providence that seemed to guide him out of emergency and into a new line of endeavor, a little closer to reality. And after a while, he wandered again. Again, nature moved against him. We determined that he should not be permitted to escape from the boundaries of survival and to place himself in a situation beyond recall. We observe this, and we are aware that these critical periods are seldom pleasant. But there is some consolation in the fact that most of them have been well deserved, and that out of them humanity as a stream of life has emerged, chastened, but strengthened. We are in such a situation today, and perhaps we are a little more worried than we ever were before because the gradual tendency in the last several centuries has been toward world involvement in crisis. Up to a comparatively recent time, critical situations were more or less isolated. One group, one structure might come into emergency. But the rest of the world went along. Now, however, the emergency is one emergency. One critical situation threatens us, and out of it must come the only solution, as we well realize and have realized for years, namely world solution. The rapid increase in communication, transportation, the wide-flung diffusion of knowledge has, uh, have all together brought this world into a very close pattern, and it is no longer possible for one part to be involved in a struggle for existence, and the other parts remain uh, tranquil observers of the situation. Today, we stand in great need for re-evaluating most of the 
the patterns and practices with which we are now involved. There are very few persons who, deep in their own hearts, do not realize that we are in the midst of trouble we have caused for ourselves. And, most disquieting, we do not seem to easily learn the lesson. Rather, we seem to prefer to go on, hazarding not only our own lives but the future of our world, rather than to face the challenge and responsibility of our time. It therefore becomes no longer a problem of the individual depending upon leadership for the preservation of his society. More and more we realize the inadequacy of leadership. Leadership to be completely successful must be absolute. The leader must have despotic power. He may be a benevolent despot, but unless he has the authority, he cannot rule, and he cannot govern any longer without the sanction of the governed. This sanction is no longer available to leadership, and in our generation, the hyper-development of individualism is resulting in the collapse of the theory of leadership. We become more and more critical of leaders, and as the problems extend themselves into greater areas, we become convinced that leaders are unable to solve these problems, that the leader has not yet appeared who has the understanding and wisdom to lead the whole world to security. And even if he did arise, there is very little probability that the whole world could agree upon his virtue or his policy. We are therefore checkmated in the traditional way in which we used to live. We are no longer able to blame the leader. We still try to. But at the same time, we begin to recognize that authority is becoming more and more limited. What authority we have had has been largely abused, but at the same time the constant limitation of authority means that we can no longer depend upon strong minds to lead weak minds. We discover that the strong minds are not strong enough really to lead, and the weak minds are not weak enough to follow, and we have a sort of impasse. And out of this impasse comes a tremendous amount of individualism, also resentment, pressure, and, as we observe it in private life, frustration. Actually, nature is trying to tell us something. It is trying to point out to us that authority is like parental guidance. Children growing up in a well-managed home accept parental leadership up to a certain time in life. Then the child must become an individual. If it fails to do so, it disgraces itself and also adds a tremendous burden to the responsibility of parenthood. The parent is not supposed to continue to administer the life of an adult. We are in the same situation. Mankind, in one way or another, is growing up. And as the child grows, it resents more and more parental authority. Yet unless this child is also equipped to accept the responsibilities of maturity, it may well have a disastrous career. This is the situation collectively which we are approaching very rapidly. So the natural answer must be, where are we going to find the directives necessary to take the place of 
despotic authority. And this brings us directly to our principal subject this evening, namely the religious problem. If we go back over the history of religion, we will realize that down through the ages it has exercised almost complete dictatorial authority over its followers. This is true of one religion as of another. The priests of religion were regarded as peculiarly venerable persons, and for both secular and sacred reasons uh, their authority was unquestioned. They had the right to determine not only the beliefs of men, but very largely the patterns of human conduct. Most religions include a revealed code of laws. These laws became the absolute statutes for those who belonged to the religion or accepted it. Even today, in most orthodox religious groups of the world, the member is still under the control of what we might term dogma. And dogma is very largely traditional authority. It is an absolute dictatorship administered by an earthly priesthood. But it is assumed that this dogma is inevitable and infallible because it arises in the consciousness of God. Therefore, against it there can be no reservation or revolution. But many religions have already vanished from the world, and others are in various decay, states of decrepitude and decay. Others are still comparatively vital. But all religion up to the present time or most religion up to the present time, has been established upon a foundation of authority. It was an authoritarian partner of the state down through the centuries. That which the religious body declared to be lawful, it was the duty of the state to enforce. It was also the duty of the state to protect the religion and to make certain that no foreign faith or foreign influence should adulterate the religion of that particular people or state. In the last hundred years, religious authority has also begun to dwindle. More and more, the power of religion over the destiny of people has changed from a factual, literal, temporal power to a psychological, theological, persuasive influence. The breakdown began in the Western civilization with the Reformation. And from that time on, we have had rising sectarianism within the structure of Christianity. Other religions which have influenced Western thinking have also felt numerous reforms. Until today, a large part of religion, especially its dogmatic part, is held to be legislative. Groups can get together and say, we will no longer accept this. They will then form a creed upon their own objection. And upon this, uh, they will uh, create a new reformed system. Thus, the ancient authority of the priest as the peculiar messenger of the Most High, as one anointed, as one set aside and apart, uh, receiving to himself the apostolic succession. Uh, this type of attitude is dwindling. And while it is still held in some areas, its authority even in these areas is substantially weakening. 
and where religion is reactionary and refuses to accept the challenge of rising human individuality, the strength of the religion is undermined by uh, an allegiance from members who do not actually conform. Thus we have a breakdown within the structure in which we still have the follower, but he is following only in part, and is following only according to his own mental, spiritual, or emotional reservations. Now it is obvious that with this situation, uh, religion is also essentially and structurally weakened. It no longer has the power of leadership. It can no longer loose and unloose. It can no longer declare the way of states. It cannot control legislation. It cannot control education. It cannot control industry. It therefore has a moderate or nominal influence. And even where the sect is still extreme, its influence is less extreme, because it cannot hold the full allegiance of its followers or members to these extreme positions. Out of all of this has come a point of view which has gradually led many people to feel that religion is in a measure at least private business. The religion is no longer of the power of a faith to, to dictate the destiny of its millions or hundreds of millions of followers. Today, faith is more or less a moral influence, a guide, a source of certain psychological strength something that we are better with than without, but it is not a dynamic. So where we lose the power of the state to dictate the laws of men, and the power of religion to direct and control and even chastise the souls of men, we lose another bracket of leadership, and we find the individual drifting further and further toward a complete humanism. But man, by nature, has to admire something. He has to have a strong belief in something. And in the 19th century came the beginning of a new structure of belief. And this structure of belief was a certain scientific legislative biology. Out of this problem came, through such leaders as Darwin and Huxley, the beginning of our concept that man's final ruler was natural law. That if you wish to call this natural law God, well and good. If, however, you wish to consider this law merely an automatic process existing in space, this was also well and good. You no longer had the problem of good and evil. You had merely the problem of salvation or destruction. You no longer had man moved or persuaded by some rich emotional experience. You had him led by a certain type of common sense, an intellectual leadership by which he was presumed to recognize that only by certain types of conduct could he preserve his civilization. Conduct then became a matter of science, because it called upon the individual to recognize the relationship of cause and effect in conduct, and that this law of cause and effect was merely an aspect, we will say, of the great evolutionary process taking place in nature. So we had what is referred to in the earliest documents of our own nation, nature and nature's God. 
And this concept of nature's God brought us very close to a new kind of scientific pantheism. And this, to a measure, still prevails among many of our intellectual groups. The next step beyond this was, of course, the gradual aggrandizing of the scientific position. The scientists began to take over the attributes of the divinely appointed king and the heavenly blessed priest. The scientists became, to a measure, the concept of the new savior or preserver of mankind. Now, this preservation was largely to be interpreted in terms of man's present existence. Science was to bring heaven to earth for man, to turn his mind and his eyes from any invisible universe beyond the mortal ken, and focus these eyes directly upon the possibility of building here in this world the noblest monument to progress that humanity had ever seen. Thus progress became the new universal concept of the divine will. Uh, science became the new instrument of absolute knowledge. And in this emancipated world of things, the scientist was a little lost at first because he really had not expected to inherit either a crown or a tiara. He had been more inclined to suspect that he might inherit the Inquisition or something of that nature, as he had done on previous occasions when he had been what Lord Bacon calls a birth out of time, that is, before the world was ready for him. Now we find that uh, between about 1925 and 1960, uh, the great religion of science, gaining more and more authority in our internal lives. Now, this was not necessarily authority demanded. It was authority freely bestowed. And to understand just how freely it has been bestowed, we must consider the story of our young people. Young people today are rising up in an economic industrial system in which science is the principal directing force. The great careers of today are in science. Uh, we are warned constantly that in education our young people are not receiving enough science so that they can compete successfully with the rising scientific power of communism, for example. The race is now toward the development of the super-scientist, the individual whose life is completely immersed in the wonders of the scientific universe. Now, it's not difficult to be captured in this pattern. We only have to observe the extraordinary advancements in many fields of specialization to realize how easily even a reasonably well-integrated human being could become enraptured, could develop a strong emotional sense, could have loyalty and patriotism and devotion and dedication to this thing which we call science. It seemed as though it was going to answer all the questions. It seemed as though it was going to give us what we had so long hoped for, and that is physical security. At the same time, it enabled us to free our minds from certain unfavorable aspects of previous leadership. We could begin to say to ourselves that we are not only free from the despotism of hereditary princes, we are also now free from the dogmatic despotism of theology. We no longer find ourselves limited and restrained intellectually. 
There is no longer a penalty upon thinking. The individual not only considered himself as addicted to a new and wonderful world, but in many, many ways he compared this new world with the old and found the new world better. This was especially easy, of course, with younger generations who had no memory, actually, of the better things of older times and could only read the atrocities recorded in history. Now, in the midst of this wonderful reintegration around the new concept of value, the scientific world has fallen apart. This was bad. When we say it has fallen apart, we don't mean that it is at the end of its career or that it can no longer contribute any good to mankind. But as a great image, a great image of man's hope, as the mysterious figure of the great God of the future, science has lost stature very rapidly. And today we are confronted with the extremely obvious situation that science is now one of the principal dangers to security and to the survival of our way of life. The good that science can do, we applaud. The mistakes it makes, we begin to see. And the moment we begin to see mistakes, it is like finding feet of clay on our God. This tremendous devotion, this complete and soul rapture with which young people have turned to science. This is breaking down because science is actually failing these young people in the problem of their own survival. It is giving them a career but not a life. It is giving them a job but not a purpose. It is giving them a certain amount of comfort, but they are compensated or penalized by being in the midst of the worst insecurity the world has ever known. Now this leaves us in a rather dilapidated situation. One kind of God after another has failed us. It isn't really ever, has never been a God that failed us. It was our concept of that which was important that failed us. We gave far too much power and authority to the Roman Caesars, and Rome paid for this by the loss of the Roman Empire. We gave very much too uh, much devotion and allegiance to the medieval popes, and as a result of that we had the Reformation and the gradual loss of the prestige of theology. We gave too much exaggerated allegiance to science, and now again we discover that our exaggerations have gotten us into difficulty. So we look around us again, and we try to figure out the best we can what kind of a world we live in. More than this, where are we going to turn for directives? Our politicians are not getting any better. Our uh, theologians are not getting any wiser. Our scientists are not getting any more ethical. And our businessmen are not getting much out of anything except money and taxes. This gets to be rather frustrating, that this tremendous struggle this vast effort that we have made down through the ages seems now as though it is to bear little fruit and that it truly is turning into a withered vine just about the time when it should bear its noblest fruit. The individual has other ways to look, of course, and one way we have had a tendency to look in recent years has been to look over the fence and see how some other people lived. This has led to a term which we call interreligious understanding. 
we are beginning to suspect that perhaps somebody is better off than we are. We also are being able to enjoy the fact that other people suspect that we are better off than they are. And as a result, everybody is now looking into everybody else's backyard in the hope of discovering that distant pastures are greener. This is a good step. For the first time, we are beginning to face up to the fact that all the world has the same problem, and that if we would unite our resources, perhaps we could advance something a little nearer to solution. That somewhere lurking among, among the beliefs of mankind, there might be a good one, one better than we have suspected. Or perhaps, out of several weak ones, we can mold one stronger one, in which the weaknesses of one are counteracted by strong points in the structure of another. It looks, therefore, very much to many people that the only answer to religion at the moment is to try to find out where it is being well practiced and where it is producing constructive results and examine in that direction. This, however, can re lead rapidly to another mistake, because in our immediate haste, which is the keynote of the moment, we are quite likely to reach desperately toward some other faith. When we do this, we lose perspective again. We become too inclined, perhaps, to criticize everything in our own and accept without reservation everything in someone else's, simply because it is strange and different or because it has not the peculiar weaknesses or difficulties with which we are most familiar. Out of all of the uh, hoping and struggling that we have done, there is slowly shifted to the top of things, perhaps the most neglected area of, of thought the world has ever known, and that is philosophy. Up to five years ago, philosophy was considered to be little better uh, than a nasty word. Uh, people of good breeding did not use it. It was better to be caught swearing than using the word philosophy. We were told that if it was put on the title of a book, it would not sell. We were told that if it was mi me mentioned in mixed company, it would result in a deadly silence. We were also warned that it suggested mental hardship that philosophy suggested thinking, and never in history has thinking been generally popular, and in this generation less popular than ever before. This is why we're in the problem. Either thinking must become more popular, or we will be in a worse problem. So in uh, looking around among other nations, we discovered something that was rather strange to our own religious experience. Namely, that in many parts of the world, religion is a philosophy rather than a faith. This does not necessarily mean that other religions were lacking in faith, but that a good many religious beliefs were actually founded upon thinking. And uh, contrary to our rather Western way of doing it, uh, thinking was not a detriment to orthodoxy. In the Western world, when you started to think, uh, your religious friends began to shake their heads. You were in trouble. And also, if you asked too many questions, you would ruin almost any system of theology. But in uh, other parts of the world, religion asked questions and invited its followers to ask questions. And we found here and there, scattered around among some reasonably respectable peoples, religions that were actually based upon asking questions, that the individual was expected to inquire, expected to, expected to study, and that in order to be a good member of a religion, you had to spend eight or ten years actually learning what it was. This looked very different from anything that we knew about. 
Because, as Voltaire used to say, we solved the whole problem with a dash of cold water on the occiput. In other words, <laughs> if the individual is baptized, he's saved. Now, we found that some of our neighbors on one side of the world or the other believe that salvation uh, required not only water but a little good soap with it. <laughs> and this was quite a shock to us. So you can't blame a number of people for turning rather enthusiastically toward religious philosophies that not only ask questions but are not afraid to answer them. And we began to develop what most of our more conservative friends uh, would regard as, as a most suspicious tendency to heterodoxy, or perhaps even to heresy. But it felt rather good being a heretic, and so <laughs> folks kept right on meditating according to yoga, or sitting quietly and disciplining their minds by Zen, or attending small groups of Vedantic uh, students, and uh, we're no longer surprised that some of the Eastern religions sent missionaries over here to save us, because we had been so long engaged in saving them that we uh, didn't get around to realizing that we were in poor shape ourselves. But out of the contact that we had with religions primarily outside of our own, I think our main uh, reaction was the discovery of religious philosophy. We began to think of religion more as a series of answers uh, to pressing questions, especially questions relating to conscience and conduct that religions and philosophies demanded something of the individual beside his economic support, that these faiths demanded the example of his character in action. And it dawned upon us that many religious people in the world firmly believe that religion is a way of life according to character and conduct. Well, this came home to us as a bit of a surprise, but it led many people to the re-evaluation of the place of philosophy in knowledge. Uh, ten years ago, psychology was very proud of the fact that it had escaped the boundaries of philosophy, that a psychologist uh, was now a free soul in a branch of learning which he was creating and dignifying in his own way. In the last five years, more and more psychological journals and technical papers in the field uh, are taking the attitude that the psychologist is proud of the fact that psychology is part of philosophy. This is indeed a new point of view. But, after all, uh, psychology can help you part of the time, but without philosophy you're in trouble most of the time. So the uh, understanding of philosophy became uh, more or less uh, necessary. So, with great enthusiasm, we suddenly remember that we had a number of philosophers in the West who had been resting quietly in cultural limbo for the last 500 years. Uh, when we got out of the Dark Ages, we also got out of philosophy. And uh, with the exception of a few illustrious names, which we could quote but never read, uh, we didn't know too much about philosophy in the West. So we began looking into the various contributions of unusual people, ranging over perhaps 2,500 years of Western culture. Plato broke into the daily newspaper. Aristotle became a subject for Rotarian discussion, and things that had not happened for a long time uh, suddenly started happening in our modern world. But here we were in a real trouble, perhaps in a worse trouble we'd ever been in along the way at all, because now we had probably 500 philosophers to choose from. 
Most of them did not agree with each other. And many of them were in open conflict with each other. And, and most of these different schools we had only a few surviving representatives, and these in turn were rather, shall we say, abstract personalities wandering around college campuses in a daze. We didn't have very much in the form of an integrated pattern of what philosophy means. We had come to the conclusion that it was merely a basis for intellectual argument that it was a sharpening of the mind and the wits, but that it had nothing to do with the way you lived. And uh, for years, a philosophy was studied, but never applied to the daily problem of the individual. It was refreshing, therefore, to find that some of the earlier philosophers, especially, did make definite applications and men uh, belonging to such schools as the Platonic and the Neoplatonic and the Neopythagorean were persons who lived what they believed. And this was what we were beginning to suspect was necessary. But philosophy did not offer us very much of an immediate hope or help. It was something we would have to come to sometime, but uh, the time was really not yet. The emergency was such that we could not solve it completely by philosophical means. That is, the average person did not have the instruments necessary to do this. So nature and nature's God, to quote again the Declaration of Independence, uh, seemingly was precipitating us into a dilemma. We had come almost... Uh, to the end of a series of mistaken policies. And the end that we were reaching was the end of personal impoverishment of character. We are still rather seriously worried about the ethical decline which is now being noticed by even those with the greatest degree of scientific astigmatism. They still now begin to see that there is real trouble. No one at the moment seems to know what to do about it. But I think the answer that finally will have to come is that the real purpose behind the emergency is to gradually shift the responsibility for personal growth upon the person where it belongs. I doubt very much if we will ever again pass through great periods of religious dictatorship. I don't think we will have the type of religious experience we have had in the past. I don't believe the spiritual good of mankind will be trusted to individuals who must become the leaders and guides of the rest. We will undoubtedly continue to produce great religious people. There is no question about that. But these people will be respected but not worshipped. The time has come when the entire problem of man's spiritual life must be solved by the person. Now, he has available to him most of the instruments of solution. He has in the world today, with its rapidly increasing uh, contact, an opportunity never before possible to avail himself of the best available knowledge and also the opportunity to orient his point of view in the largest area of knowledge that man has ever possessed. A hundred years ago, comparative religion simply meant comparing several Protestant Christian sects. Today, comparative religion means and really means the study of the eight or ten religions of the world, which may be properly examined by any thoughtful person and no legislation can prevent it. We have, therefore, as never pre previously available, all of the general information necessary to orient ourselves in our own religious life. 
You all remember dear old Dr. Elliot's five-foot bookshelf. Dr. Elliot was convinced that by taking his five-foot bookshelf and were studying on it for, or from it for a half an hour a day, you could, in from three to five years, attain an almost universal education. You would be equipped for almost any ordinary problem that confronts an educated person. Now, this was not a particularly heavy program when we realize that most of us waste more time than that every day. But it is true that what we need to know in order to clarify our own mind is available to us if we want to use it. Now, we look around us as De Quincey looked around the British Museum, and then we weep as he did because we can't live long enough to read all the books. This is not necessary. We are now in possession of major works, selective works, which we can read. And most of what we need to know is available to us during the years of our mature life. And from what we are able to learn, we can arrive at very strong inner reactions, which we can direct in almost any way that seems best to our own understanding. So out of all of this long path of things, and the confusion and the chaos and the crises that have gone before, we stand for the first time, perhaps, in the actual presence of the possibility of a religious life based not upon dogma or birth or conversion, but based upon the fact that the human being is by nature religious and that therefore he has a spiritual potential within himself by which he can live a proper life under the leadership of a consciousness aware of the basic needs of the human personality. So we now have uh, the problem of putting together a personal religious life and all that has gone before has led in this direction. But like lazy children, we did not want to learn in order that we could ultimately labor. We wanted to learn in order that we might, in the end, come only to leisure. This is not nature's way, and nature will never support us in this procedure. So we now stand on the threshold of a universe of experience and of consciousness which we have to live in. Each moment we are stepping into tomorrow. And each one of us will have to face some tomorrows, some more, some less, but we will all have to face them. And we will have to face them with increasing interior insight. For if we are unable to do this, the problem of the future will become heavier and heavier, and we will become more and more discouraged and uh, de even destroyed uh, by the pressure of external circumstances. Out of this situation, philosophy, science, religion, education, all of these instruments together must provide us with the raw materials of a greater faith. Each one of these institutions and structures that we have built up must show us both their strength and their weakness. Their strength will help us. Their weakness we must avoid. If they have gone to excess, we must seek for moderation. If they have ignored vast areas of essential knowledge, we must cultivate these areas in ourselves. It is our duty to live a balanced life and make balanced use of the unbalanced forces that surround us. If we do not do this, we cannot build our own spiritual conviction. The most dynamic group, probably, working in the world today is one of the smallest, and that is the atheist. 
The atheist is not a new production. We like to think of him as peculiar to our own century, but this is not true. There were atheists in ancient India, and there were atheists in Greece. There were a great many atheists in Rome. And I'm afraid there have been a great many atheists in religion, although they didn't actually come out and proclaim themselves as such. Uh, today, atheism is now linked with a political point of view. And it has gradually gained a small but intense following. Atheism has the same peculiar type of tactic uh, which has distinguished communism for a long time. The communist may be a comparative minority, but he is a dynamic minority. He is a minority that relentlessly and continually presses its own purpose. Our intellectual atheist is in approximately the same type of mind. And we know that uh, most of the personalities in communism are self-proclaimed atheists. Now, it's a hard thing exactly to understand how it happens that atheists are willing to become merchants of death. You would think that an atheist who has no place to go when he leaves here would want to stay here as long as possible. You would think also that he would be the last type of individual who would want to die for a forlorn cause. You would not think also that he would want to blow up his own civilization or his own culture. Because if he has no place to go, and there is nothing in front of him but oblivion, something very strange must have happened to him. He must be a terribly unhappy person, or he would not be willing to accept what might be little more than a suicidal complex. We cannot quite justify the atheist in his gradual intensification of a scientific industrial program which is fatal to himself. If he could believe honestly that he could die for his cause and then go into some paradisical sphere like the followers of Hassan Saba, it might be nice to die for a leader if from then on you lived in paradise. But what is the peculiar advantage of dying for a leader if here and on you don't live anywhere? That the entire subject is, is one of absolute negation. What particular value is there in anything, winning anything, if, as, Hamlet, as it says in Hamlet, the, S, the rest is silence? Just what does atheism do? It not only cuts off man's hope of a future existence, but by its pre present policies cuts short his present existence and threatens the total annihilation of his way of life. Just where is the gain? Where is the objective? Where is the purpose? We may say that it is social progress, but atheistic science is threatening the survival of social progress. So very little remains. Your atheistic minority, therefore, represents a completely defeated group of some kind, a group which has accepted internal defeat, that has lost sight of all real motives or all real purposes, and is deficient in all positive convictions. Agnosticism we can understand. It can well be the belief of an honest doubter. But atheism is not agnosticism. Nor is it a, an honest doubt. It is a forthright unbelief, a complete disbelieving. And for what end? For what purpose? For what good? For what conceivable result that can have any significance to man, nature, or the universe? This is, a, is an imponderable. But we notice, little by little, how this situation is encroaching, just as certain communistic concepts continue to encroach and infiltrate. For instance, in the paper not long ago, I noticed an article that represented an expression about the future of labor in this country. It was uh, apparently a completely harmless statement. 
to the effect that in a very short time man would be able to reduce his problem of labor so that he could work for nine days and then rest for five, thus creating a new concept of leisure. But in this studious way, the concept of the Sabbath was lost right there, and no one even noticed it. There was no longer going to be any Sunday, as there is no longer any Sunday behind the Iron Curtain. Well, a Sunday is not so important, but it is a symbol of something. It is a symbol of another encroachment upon an ancient pattern of belief, a gradual weaning of the mind away, little by little, from every religious anchorage. Now, there can well be, even among communistic people, a sad story of what religion did to them, of the difficulties they faced, and the hardships they went through because of the cruelty of both church and state. But this does not justify the, the destruction of a basic idea merely because that idea has been perverted. We are still not in any condition to live without some conviction beyond uh, the belief in our own superlative genius. Uh, with this type of believing, we are heading into, um, I won't say limbo, because limbo was a comparatively a painless place. We are going to head into something infinitely more uncomfortable. So we come to the final situation that all of this conspiracy and much more that we can't possibly summarize in the time that we have is bringing everything back as a responsibility to the person. We are now living in a universe large enough in our own comprehension to enable us to think through for ourselves the essential values that we regard as important. And we have also reached a point where these values cannot be dogmatic, that they are not something thrust upon us, something held over our head with a whip in the other hand. They are now our own needs reaching out for the answer that will save us. So we really are becoming perhaps less theological, but essentially we have a greater capacity to be religious than ever before, because we are beginning to approach religion in its highest form, and that is the direct communion between man and his own ideals, the principles and the truths which he holds to be most certainly true and necessary to himself. So how are we going to build a universal concept now? I think we stand, most of all, at a dividing point between the belief in God and no belief at all. Science has very largely tried to destroy the God concept in the universe, but it has not succeeded in doing so. For, for principally and factually, the more we discover about the universe, the greater our original question becomes. Given us many answers to great questions. Actually, science has enlarged the great question for which we have no answer. This suddenly means to us that whereas a couple of thousand years ago the universe was so small that a couple of Caesars and Charlemagne could well nigh have built it, the universe today is infinitely greater. There was a time when it was honestly believed that a mortal man could rule the universe. Today we know this isn't so. Today we have come to know as never before the magnitude of this universe. If this is an accident, the accident becomes more fantastic every moment. If this is a machine, the machine transcends any concept of machine that we have ever known or ever thought of. If this is merely a continuance of blind force, 
blind force has, dis has developed extrasensory perceptions because there is no evidence of blindness in the great forces that move existence. Out of the entire pageantry of increasing knowledge, the great question of where did it start just gets bigger. Instead of having answers, we merely push back the horizon of our comparative knowing. But as Buddha said, as veil upon veil we lift, we find veil upon veil behind. The universe suddenly emerges as a splendor of laws and processes, of forces and forms, of agencies and energies, utterly beyond the comprehension of man a hundred years ago. But these discoveries do not make an atheist, nor do they really give much comfort or consolation to an honest agnostic. They simply confront us with the continuing need for an answer that actually answers the problems as they are, and the answer is not forthcoming. We get more and more questions, and occasionally a little discovery is handed out to us on a platter to cause us to no longer question. But actually, there are more questions at this moment than ever before in the history of man. We have, therefore, to come in the end to one of two conclusions. And the second one isn't much good. The first conclusion is, as Sir James Jeans finally realized, that there is only one answer, namely, that there is a conscious principle at the source of life. That this universe is not an accident that the whole concept of accident is simply a human stupidity. That even in the careers of people, what we call an accident is not what it seems to be. And certainly there is no record that a series of accidents could bring forth a galaxy. We study these uh, factors as we can see them. We realize the infinite pageantry of orderly processes we suddenly realize that we are living in a universe which becomes, as far as we can see, the only staple thing in existence. We've come into the presence of wonder after miracle, and we are expected to view this tremendous fact without responding to the instinctive and inevitable power within ourselves which would of itself bring us to our knees. No longer to our knees in uh, servile acceptance, but to our knees in simple, natural humility. Bring us to the realization that we do exist within a pattern, within a plan, which is worthy of our understanding and which quietly but inevitably requires our obedience. Now, this does not throw us into a mass of superstitions. We do not have to become concerned about an elderly gentleman with a long gray beard who tosses the sun off in front and the moon behind. We are no longer required to assume that the earth was slipped under man at some remote time when he started to fall so that he wouldn't keep on falling. These things we do not need. But we do need to realize that this vastness which we can perceive, a part at least, and this infinite order which we can behold, a part at least, inevitably requires, as the uh, ancient Chaldean said, the existence of a principle of principles a power over powers, a tremendous purposeness unfolding itself eternally through this multitude of ever-evolving worlds, 
This we have to face. And this, perhaps, is the beginning of our new religion. This is the beginning of a series of simple moral conclusions built firmly upon everything that we know. See, one of our earlier mistakes was to try to make religion strong by weakening every other form of knowledge, to try to preserve religious dogma, if necessary, by the sacrifice of fact. This we have learned to be a mistake. We now know that the unfoldment of religion must be an unfoldment in harmony with fact, that we cannot afford to believe anything that is contrary to the operations of laws which we can actually experience. There may be much more than we can experience, but we have no right to assume that that which we do experience is not a lawful part of that which is still unknown. So our philosophy and our religion must be kept sufficiently open so that into it can be built all new knowledge without interfering with honorable belief. Thus our beliefs must be as broad and deep in the beginning as possible. And there can be no dogma, there can be no prejudice which can prevent us from accepting that which is known to be true. If therefore faith builds in harmony with the known fact of things, this faith will not run into the difficulties that we have previously encountered. We can therefore continue to glorify the cause of all things and the source of all things and to recognize that new knowledge is merely a further revelation of universal glory, that there can be no conflict, that when we discover that there is something smaller than these minute atoms with which we are now concerned, this does not overthrow theology. It simply gives us another new and deeper understanding or insight into the mystery of universal religion. So we can, uh, to a measure at least, benefit by some of our Buddhist brethren who at an early time decided that there would be no conflict between religion and science. And therefore, there has never been a scientific discovery that conflicts with Buddhism, because Buddhism simply won't be conflicted with. It has no dogma. Buddha, by his own psychological and almost scientific mind, realized the danger of dogma and realized the fact that finally man must experience that all true knowledge is good and that the individual who has the greatest understanding of facts has the greatest capacity for religion. If this gets to be rather fashionable in the West, it may help us out of one of our problems. It will certainly end squ uh, squ squabbling over things which are not important and will allow us to face the universe in the search of God rather than to lock ourselves in a mass of small problems. When we were a small people living in small towns, in small countries, where our knowledge was seldom extended beyond the ABCs, and our only text was the Bible, where man worked from dawn to dark to merely provide himself for the necessities of life. We lived in a small world. We thought small thoughts, and we could argue and wrangle over small matters. But this has changed. We now live in a large world which demands large thoughts. And large thoughts and little thoughts cannot live in the same mind. If the little thoughts dominate, we're a bigot. If the big thoughts dominate, we move victoriously toward true religious insight. Now, if we get to the point, then, where we can begin to recognize the principle of deity 
as universal consciousness. We do not know what universal consciousness means. We do not know what human consciousness is. But we know that there is a mysterious something of aliveness in us, by which we are self-aware, by which also we plan destiny, by which we love and fear, hope and think, by which all our various attitudes and opinions are motivated and vitalized, and by which we can say we are a person. This mass of energy within ourselves, a luminous kind of self-knowing energy, we like to think of as consciousness. We also like to assume that consciousness directs action, that if man did not have a life within himself, he couldn't move. If the universe did not have a life within itself, it couldn't move. Corpses do not continue their normal living functions, and a lifeless universe will not. We also know from our researches that planets and suns and worlds are born and die. Therefore, life and death as we know it exist in space. Consequently, there is consciousness which can depart from suns and moons and planets in the same way that it can depart from human beings. Therefore, there has to be a principle of life. Otherwise, this principle of life could not be either nearer nor further, nor could it be present nor depart. And in this tremendous recognition, we begin to see the magnitude of a proper God-realization. And this God-realization manifests through its most natural and obvious attributes, not through uh, particular persons. Its priesthood is the stars and the earth and the mountains. For everywhere, nature itself bears witness. It is nature vested in the robes of glory. It is nature the high priest of the divine mysteries. And we perceive everywhere these laws, these qualities, these ethics and uh, cultures essential in nature, in the universe. Otherwise, they could not be experienced by any single creature fashioned out of this common stuff. Thus, we have the basis for morality, for ethics for culture, for belief, for vision, for hope, and for faith, because we live in a universe in which all of these can be justified by facts, the great fact being the sovereignty of the total within which we exist. Now, if we wish to assume this, it is only one very simple step to Plato's next concept. Namely, that this consciousness, being the total and sole director of all that exists, is in a strange way the only and complete despot. Here is the only actual authority. There is no authority other than the authority of cosmic consciousness itself. Now, cosmic consciousness, from what we are able to learn, is no respecter of persons. It does not compromise its own principles to please any set of rules set up by man. Cosmic consciousness does that which cosmic consciousness, experiencing within itself, knows to be true and inevitable. Therefore, cosmic consciousness becomes its own only critic, its only censor. Nothing can govern it but itself. And that which it wills, that which it determines, that which it resolves, out of the infinite totality of its own nature, has to be. And why should man not acknowledge the simple fact that whatever this cosmic consciousness ordains, decrees, and wills, this must be good. 
We can object to it. But in a strange way, our objections are not even overruled. Nobody is aware of them but ourselves. We can shake our fist at heaven. It has been done before. But as the old American Indian story says, the moon is not disturbed by the howling of wolves. Nothing that we say or nothing that we do can have any more effect than the sovereign power of Canute the Dane, who found that all his sovereignty couldn't hold back the tide. Nothing that we think about, wish for, hope for, or believe has any validity unless it is in absolute accordance with sovereignty itself. Also, we must assume that as there can be nothing else, that we cannot say that the nature of consciousness is good and evil. Consciousness cannot be good and evil, because consciousness can be only itself and that which is itself has to be good. There is no other way in which it can function. Now, we could say, if we wanted to, that this consciousness could become very temperamental, and it could do a number of absurd things. Yet if this consciousness was absurd, absurdity would still be flaw, because there is no recourse beyond it. But we have no evidence that this consciousness is absurd. We have no reason whatsoever to assume that any conclusion of this consciousness is unrealistic. So we assume, and have to assume, that it is good. And that we must also assume that we cannot escape from it whether we like it or not. No matter how far we go into space, we can never escape it. We can never reach a point where we are not under the governorship of it. For could we theoretically reach its extremity, we would cease because we are part of it. So the part can never escape from the whole, and the part can never be greater than the whole. So we are, so we say, stuck. <laughs> now the experience of this is perhaps the most beautiful religious experience in life. For it suddenly places us in the midst of a plan. A plan that rests in a power which alone has absolute consciousness. The only thing in the universe that knows where the universe is going is the consciousness that ensouls it. Planets, suns, moons, stars, elements, creatures do not know. But as the only thing within man that knows where man is trying to go is his own consciousness, so the only thing in space that knows its own purpose is that consciousness which ensouls space. Thus it is not within our ordinary possibility to argue the matter, uh, to discuss it fluently, or to have many opinions about it. As the Eastern philosopher realizes, in the presence of this great fact, all that we have is the personal right of complete acceptance. Now, this acceptance is, is, a, is a little trick in itself, because we all have to accept finally. But we can accept in a series of ways. We can grudgingly accept. We can accept only when we have exhausted every effort to avoid acceptance. We can go down to glorious defeat, shaking our fist at the inevitable. But this acceptance will come. And the wise person is the one who accepts in the first place. For as the Greek philosopher pointed out, the difference between a fool and a wise man is simply this, that a wise man loves to do what a fool has to do. <laughs> and this is our problem in space. We are confronted by this inevitable. And here is the beginning of our religion. Our religion must be perhaps the simplest the world has ever known. 
For all that we have to have to make this religion is that we shall ensoul knowledge with faith. In other words, without faith, knowledge is meaningless. But with faith, knowledge becomes a constant means of strengthening our inner conviction about the great truth of the thing as it is. So all we really need is to have a faith great enough so that the mistakes of men cannot overthrow it, a faith strong enough to survive the struggle between knowledge and ignorance that must take place within ourselves before faith can be secure. Faith, actually, is merely this acceptance, but a beautiful acceptance, an acceptance with rejoicing. And here the Greeks did a rather better job of it than we do, because most of their religious festivals were occasions of great joy. Uh, most of these people did not worship in fear and in tears. They were not very much concerned with sin. Because, after all, uh, sin is only a mistake to begin with, and why get all worked up over it? The main thing is to continue to grow towards a realization of the beauty of life itself. If we, if we become sufficiently aware of the magnificence of the universal plan, we will get over our sins in due course. But the most important thing is to rejoice in the magnificent acceptance which our consciousness makes possible for us. The Greeks were much concerned with consciousness, although, strangely enough, they never had the word. They used other words to signify it. But they did concern themselves with its meaning. And their concept was that the great experience in life is for man to become aware of the universe, not only as sovereign power, but as the most beautiful thing existing in, in anywhere in the universal reality. For deity is not only this absolute truth, this absolute principle, this absolute wisdom, this immutable law, but deity is a magnificent snowflake-like structure of infinite geometric perfect perfection, the most splendid and adorable form in the entire world. So to become aware of the universal plan is to become immersed in the beauty and the sublimity of this vastness which exceeds us in every way. We really should be able to raise our heads to heaven and laugh not at heaven, but with heaven, at the very sheer joy of existing. And this should not be the laugh of a hypocrite, nor should be the laugh of a tyrant. It should be the laugh of a small child that has just discovered a butterfly. It should be the laugh of the growing one reaching out to grasp the stars. It is the true laughter of sheer joy within the heart and the soul, in the presence of great beauty. So out of these principles come a series of natural reactions that do not have to be especially violent or especially dramatic. They are simply a series of gradually unfolding acceptances. Now when man comes to this conclusion about the universe, he naturally asks about his own relationship to it. Man was created. Man is a product of cosmic consciousness. Just how, we don't know. But what else could he be a product of? If there is only one immutable and inevitable consciousness permeating all things, and this consciousness as all theologians will admit of God, is the supreme power. Where else could man have come from? Can we conceive of man as anything except one of the unfolding expressions of this 
cosmic purpose. Man, in some way, is necessary. We now begin to realize, as we look around, that there's scarcely a single gnat or bug that isn't necessary. This gives us hope. There may be reason for us. <coughs> But we discover that whenever we unbalance nature, if we get rid of too many ants from the side of a hill, or take too many bugs out from under the edge of a log, something goes wrong. We have disturbed natural balance. Well, man has been disturbing natural balance in his own way for a long time. But we are encouraged by the thought that the absence of man might in unbalance nature even further. It doesn't seem possible at the moment, but I think there is still a probability. Man is part of this pattern. Man is an integral part of the unfoldment of consciousness toward the self-realization of its own nature. Consciousness in space is very difficult for us to localize. The Egyptians tried to see it in the many-rayed figure of the sun. Various peoples have created emblems of it. But gradually, philosophic nations have come to the conclusion that the consciousness in man is perhaps our most perfect symbol of the universal consciousness. So there's something growing up in man, something that needs man just as much as man needs it. And in this universe, man is an inevitable structure, and his appearance and his uh, bodily form and function, these things probably differ with all possible environments in space, but we have no reason to doubt that intelligent creatures of some kind with varying degrees of consciousness, greater or lesser than our own, inhabit every planet in the entire galaxy that we can see. So man is important in his own small but very significant way. Consequently, it is inconceivable to assume that man's purpose does not abide forever in the divine mind. Man's purpose is part of universal purpose. Man is not a merely a passing experiment to be tried and thrown away. Man has endured a long time and suffered much. He has worked and labored to build by degrees what small conscious understanding he has attained. Perhaps he has been working, according to conservative anthropologists, for a million years. They're pushing the dates back every day. Perhaps he has been working a hundred million years in forms no longer regarded as human. But he has been struggling up from the unknown, up from the inadequate, towards the gradual estate which he has presently attained. Therefore, there is absolutely no reason to assume or suppose that man is essentially uh, merely an incident, that man is expendable. He is not expendable any more than an atom is expendable. There is a reason for him, and the problem he must try to do is to understand that reason. And if he can't understand the reason because he doesn't have as yet sufficient insight, then he has to accept that reason and consider it quite reasonable that a universe in which everything is well regulated did not create him by accident. So man's part in the plan is essentially is essentially in that plan and of that plan, and is not divisible from it. So man becomes quietly, modestly important. Now, if man has any reason whatsoever for his existence, uh, certainly we have to search for two kinds of reason. We have to search for the little reasons that men have. And as we add those all together and examine them, we find out they don't add up to much. The reasons that we most commonly give for our own survival or our own existence are not of any great importance. There is really nothing that man has accomplished in industry that can't be at least archetypally associated with an ant. 
We are not really more successful in most of our enterprises than the members of lesser kingdoms with greater limitation of faculty and power. So that man's real purpose has to have something to do with this fact that man is the only creature that we know of that can plan his own destiny consciously. That man is the only creature that knows and remembers that he was born and knows that he will die. These peculiar forms of knowledge separate him from every other creature. Therefore, they have something to do with the significance of his place in space. So considering the fact that we are living in a vast universe of life and not in a universal graveyard, there is no reason to assume by common sense or by any other reason that man individually has no purpose because man's consciousness is individual. The idea that man has a collective purpose, such as to leave more apartment houses to his children than he inherited when he was born, doesn't mean anything, because nature isn't concerned with these things. But the facts also indicate that collective salvation, or the idea that man is merely to be saved through his progeny, doesn't really mean anything. Because the only part of man that is his own conscious nature is his own. The growing child is not the inheritor of the parent's consciousness because the parent is still alive and has it. The consciousness of the child belongs to itself. The consciousness of the parent belongs to itself. And it is this consciousness which is its universal part. Consequently, it is part of the inevitable purpose of life that if it individualizes consciousness as it has in man, it is not going to save that consciousness by causing it to cease to be individual and become part of a collective lump. This is not the purpose that nature intended. The only point in which consciousness as a, a factor ceases to have individual significance is when that consciousness is ultimately reunited with the infinite consciousness itself. Certainly death is no answer to any of these questions. And man is forced to conclude that if the universal consciousness knows what it is doing, man has to be immortal. There is just no other answer. Because otherwise the universe is creating something only to destroy it, and in destroying it, to destroy all the attainment that this thing has achieved down through thousands of years of growth. This is not thinkable in a well-ordered universe, any more than it would be thinkable that we would allow our children to suffer until they're 21 years old and then shoot them. This does not make sense in our lives nor in the universe. We are c compelled to assume that immortality is inevitable. Now, we are not sure just what we mean by immortality. Perhaps by immortality we mean the survival of our own consciousness in universal consciousness. Perhaps we are forced to admit with Aristotle that this is not absolute. Perhaps we can say that this solar system, this cosmic system to which we belong, has a duration of only a certain number of billions of years. And then that the consciousness in this will also go to sleep in some vaster mystery. That we don't object to immediately. But as far as we are concerned, immortality means a continuity of consciousness after death over a vast period of time, perhaps infinite. But certainly great enough to enable the full harvesting of the purpose for which man was created. So we have really no choice but immortality. We don't have to have any dogma. We don't have to say to a man, if you don't believe it, you are going to be damned. Well, all we have to say to him really is, if you don't believe it, you're just going to be stupid. Because it makes no difference whether we believe it or not. And we have damned many people merely for the sin of stupidity. 
and sometimes the damning was due to our stupidity, not theirs. <laughs> so the, the, the simple problem stands that the immortality of man is a natural discovery resulting from our gradual increasing understanding of the immortality of space. We have suddenly come into a bigger world, therefore we have to adjust to it. And the only way we can adjust to it really is to re realize that we are a part of something bigger than we thought existed. This should not be completely unpleasant because it really is an indication of a basic value more than we have ever suspected. Now, in this situation, we come again, of course, to the great question that confronts everyone, namely, uh, what about the emergencies by which it seems that all of the progress of man is destroyed, that we might be reduced again to savagery, that we might be forced to hide in holes in the ground uh, to escape the common inhumanity of man. Uh, we might have to build a world all over again, or we might be suddenly cast out of this world more suddenly and unexpectedly than we would prefer. What does all this mean in terms of universal justice? Well, again, it all depends on what kind of a world you think you live in, because actually now your religion is based upon your understanding of the universe. In the first place, do we believe, actually, can we believe, that anything within the structure of a living being is actually destructible? We know that things are constantly changing their compounds. We know, as was written on Lord Bacon's grave, that all compounds must be dissolved. We know that change is forever taking place. We know that in consciousness we change. But is a change destruction? Or is a change merely a shifting? of a center of awareness or a center of conscious attention from one area to another is a change itself an inevitable element of the process of ever becoming by which we move from a previous to a subsequent condition by means of change. I think our answer rests again in the universe and in what we can see and in what we can know. Namely, that as far as we are able to understand, conceive, or realize, every so-called body, physical structure, or form in nature is only a conditioned energy. That every so-called unit of dead matter is actually a unit of life. That therefore there is no such thing as death anywhere in space. And what we call disintegration is merely an appearance in which a different type of life activity is released. Everywhere we turn in space, there can be only life. And all matter is merely a manifestation, an expression, a form, a condition of life itself. Therefore, if everything is life, then death as we think of it, as extinction, is not conceivable. Now, is it all further conceivable that consciousness, which is that part of our nature, which is the nearest to the divine nature, that we can conceive, that if every element of matter is immortal, which it is, that consciousness of all this compound is the only thing that can die, because our final concern is consciousness itself. If body can be dissolved but not destroyed, if forms break down into eternal living units which are themselves indestructible, 
Have we any reason to assume that consciousness is destructible? Or have we any reason to assume that as all bodies exist for the purpose of consciousness, that consciousness is less than body? If consciousness is our symbol of God, then we realize that all forms, all bodies, all mutable shapes and structures in nature become instruments for consciousness, that consciousness abides in them and departs from them. The bodies themselves cannot actually cease, but their compounds can be dissolved. Consciousness, therefore, is the one power by which we can know ourselves and be aware of the divine sovereignty which we recognize as pure consciousness in space. And we assume, and I think rightly, that if man's consciousness can cease, God can die. Because God is consciousness. And if consciousness can cease, then any time, anywhere, deity is vulnerable. Aristotle wouldn't believe that. He, therefore, liked to assume a universal, eternal, enduring consciousness. If consciousness endures anywhere, it must endure everywhere. And most wise people have come to the conclusion that human consciousness is of itself an immortal fact and that this consciousness is an expression of the divine universal consciousness, and that therefore what we call human consciousness is the divine growing up in the world which it has fashioned. That this consciousness is inevitable, indestructible, and eternal. Therefore, that this consciousness can never be less its forms can change, its purposes and functions can vary, but the substantial fact that there abides in us that which makes us seek the good, this is indestructible. That is part of an inevitable purpose which is inescapable. Now, these things are very basic. They do not lead us quickly into a lot of conflicts with our neighbors. Because one of the th most of the things we have said here so far this evening about these matters are by universal acceptance. They are not always so stated, but they are so implied. Therefore, our difficulties do not lie here. Our difficulties lie in a secondary area. Our primary convictions are much alike everywhere, the Taoists, the Buddhists, the the Shintoists, the Orthodox Jew, the Christian, and the Muslim have most of their great uh, spiritual essentials in common. Yet this commonness of value has not prevented uh, a sad confusion of creeds. And the only answer is that this is caused by permitting matters of a high controversial and uncertain nature to be given precedent over certainties. And here is where the house cleaning has got to start. Our religion must be something that is so simple and so essential that we can communicate it in a very short time. And that each point that we attempt to communicate will be in conformity with the best religious, scientific, and philosophical knowledge, that we will be speaking only of things most reasonable, completely probable, and we shall speak of them in a manner which indicates our sincerity, but not our dogmatic determination to force anyone else to the same conclusion. The only way this conclusion can be meaningful is not when it is forced, but when it inevitably arises in us. 
as a medicine for our own insufficiency, then it becomes vital. So we can clear away all of this rubbish that has to do with things that are nice, things that are pleasant, things loaded with nostalgia, things that gave great consolation and some terrible headaches to our ancestors. But these problems are not necessarily our problems. We are gradually coming beyond the time when we can afford the luxury of theological debate. We are coming to the time when there is no use trying to insist that an individual buy a bill of goods. This is not our purpose. The real purpose of religion today is to expose man to the eternal facts that he has been looking at for ages, but which he had never really accepted, because his own training had not fitted him to accept them. But our scientific and cultural training of today makes it possible for us to accept them, and to understand them, and to justify them, and to use science and philosophy to strengthen faith rather than to tear it down. As we stand in the presence of these great laws, we stand in the same presence as all other people of great and good hope. These same laws affect not only man, but every other creature. And we suddenly find that our new religion has space in it for the bugs and the flowers and the trees something we never got around to in the older ways of thinking. We also realize that we are part of a pattern which we can pass on to our children, and they in turn will enlarge it. And we will not be angry with them because they know more than we do. We will rejoice for them that they have grown further than we have grown. All of the competition of creeds which is a total waste of time and one of the most horrible causes of holy wars, the most unholy of all wars, these things are a complete loss of motion, meaningless, purposeless. Our great need today is to find the vast unities of life, and on these unities to build strongly the simple proposition that this vast body which we know has a soul, and that this soul in this power, this consciousness, is what we have called God. And we have called it God because we considered it to be ultimate good. We have called it God because we have recognized its infinite power. But now we must call it God because we begin to understand its infinite methods and have discovered that in all these methods, the sovereignty of a conscious divine power is everywhere present, and clearly indicated, and that every doubt that we raise in our own minds results ultimately in a new evidence to remove that doubt. Consequently, we can build our own religion. We can build a religion that is large enough to include the faiths of all men. We do not need to disturb these people. We do not need to make religious trouble for them. But because of the motion of our world, we are gradually dividing into two groups of human beings, those who are trying to grow and those who are trying desperately to cling to something old which they love and venerate, which is their right, but which may bring upon them a certain suffering, because it is not adequate to their present need. Therefore these people are sick, they are miserable, and they are frightened. Their only solution in nature is to achieve the end they were intended to achieve, that fear shall be the spur which will lead them to a further unfoldment of consciousness, for the only answer to fear is consciousness unfolding faith. If we sense this, 
we realize that underneath all the doubts and fears and anxieties that we may have, there is this vast movement of life which cannot fail, can never be less than itself, is untouched by the political speculations of anybody, is not primarily concerned with whether capital, labor, or management dominates a situation. A pattern which does not recognize east, west, north, or south. It recognizes only one thing, namely that it is growing up through the vast order of creation which it has fashioned, and that all things that live are the instruments of its own purpose. And that what we call our consciousness is our power to be aware because of the universal power in ourselves, the universal power in all other things. If we simply take this, we then know beyond any question of doubt that our shadows in space will not be less, that all these things that come and go are merely conditions in the ultimate purpose, and that ultimate purpose is the victory of consciousness over every existing or, in, or conceivable lack of itself, or the victory for man in a more immediate sense, the victory of his own consciousness over the darkness of his own ignorance. And uh, to give him the power to do this, one of the old Rosicrucian writers said, the sovereign power in majesty has given man three sacred books by means of which he might discover the mystery of himself. One of these books is the universe. The second is his own body with its functions and powers. And the third is the sacred scripture of his people. And these three, if worked together, form the same blending of religion, philosophy, and science, and give us the foundation for a simple natural faith, a faith which is sustained by progress, never offended by progress. For if true progress offends us, our faith is wrong. We must be prepared to meet more knowledge than we have ever known before. And we must meet it with a greater capacity to transform knowledge into consciousness in order that this growth of consciousness may always bring us peace, a peace arising from our realization of the essential goodness of the plan and the power behind the plan. Well, our time is up, so I think that's all for this evening.